In the hearing a couple of years ago, I testified, and when I say I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as a cop, okay? And you know I'm talking about Pepper in this case. I testified at Ed Poindexter's uh, trial. It was a, um, that initial trial you did after your, I forget what it's called. But anyway, I, I testified that I found the dynamite in the basement of, uh, uh, in uh, Mondo's house. And I was upset that the uh, attorney tried to say that uh, they was trying to compare my testimony to what happened back in the 70s, where it was said that uh, at the time of Sergeant Swanson was the only one that went in the basement and found the dynamite. At the trial, I said I was the only one that went in the basement and found the dynamite. And I'm sticking by that. Because the other people, if you talk to other officers involved, they will also tell you that I found the dynamite. Whatever testimony was given in the 70s, it doesn't matter. We have reports that say that, and if the defense attorneys fail to raise the questions and fail to prove us otherwise to be lying or have contradictions in our story, that's the fault of the defense attorneys. So you can be mad all you want. I found the dynamite, and you, some of you laughed when I said I tied a rope around the suitcases because I thought there was other suitcase bombs in the house, and led the rope outside to the car because I did find what I described as a, as a bomb-making factory in Mondo's house. And I took a rope out of my cruiser, tied it around the handles of three other suitcases, and had everybody duck down behind the cars, and I yanked on them to see if they would explode. And nothing happened, but there was uh, there was no dynamite in those. But I am convinced that those suitcases were in that house to make additional dynamite, to make additional bombs. Uh, you will find that at the time, uh, Pat Avina, who was the safety director, Lieutenant Perry, and others who were also on the scene uh, have most recently testified or have most recently reported to your investigator have also confirmed what I said at that second trial. They all said that some of them took off because they thought I was crazy. They thought the, um, if they didn't blow up, they didn't want to be around. But they all will tell you. And they all have said that Tim Perry's uh, account is, when he got there, I had already tied the rope around the suitcases and was ready to pull up. And so what I'm saying now is backed up by reports. So if you fail to get them, so be it. Also, I think when you're searching for this truth and reconciliation, you have to wonder who really has the most to hide, who has the most to, to gain, and who has uh, what, the most to fear. <clears throat> and I would say to you that perjury has a statute of limitations. Homicide doesn't. So your Panther friends might have more to worry about if, if the so-called truth as you see it comes out and uh, starts saying, okay, if these two didn't do it, who else in that group might have done it? I know you saw reports said there was a couple of white guys seen running from the scene and we failed to investigate. You don't have access to that. You can't prove that. So you, uh, whatever, however we handled this investigation, you're pretty much stuck with it. You haven't had a single court come back and agree to any of your appeals. You haven't had anybody reverse anything, and you're still struggling to get to other courts and, and win over public opinion. You might win public opinion, but you're not going to beat us in the courts because we wrote all the reports. And some of, some of your, your friends are afraid to be found out that they were informants. I will answer some questions here, but think about it. How were we able to do what we did? How were we able to, it wasn't all done by wiretaps. Some of your people, or in there under false pretenses. We did have people we planted in your groups, and uh, you didn't fret them out. You didn't, uh, you can't prove who was the ones because the Justice Department still holds the report. So it's really, um, we don't have, I, I personally don't have anything to fear if, if, uh, if my testimony, if I'm called back to trial. But, but again, I'm sticking to my testimony in the most recent case. And also, when you brought Dwayne Peake uh, into this with the voice analysis, 
the part that I'm not sure why you know that he also stated at the end of that interview, which wasn't part of the voice analysis, but at the end of it, he stuck in there, uh, I'm sticking to my story. I said this back then, and I'm not changing anything. And so they made the bomb in that. So um, I, I think we, we pretty much recovered in the way we handled this. And again, uh, some Panthers might have more to fear in uh, they Law enforcement. Let's uh, do a dialogue then with the chronology of the investigation itself. Uh, the first suspects were identified in the car. There was uh, an alleged social security card at the side of the, the scene uh, with, I think, a linkage to Vivian Strong's uncle. Is that correct? As far as I know, that social security card was never uh, attributed to anyone. It, couldn't, it wasn't found who. It actually belonged to him. Okay. And uh, we uh, never investigated anyone who identified themselves as being Vivian Strong's uncle. The investigation then moves towards Dwayne Peake, is that correct? And what leads did you have with regard to Mr. Peake? Well, how Mr. Peake was involved is that actually we played the 911 tape to a couple of different people. We played it to um, Donald Peake, his brother. He said it sounded like the one. We played it to Annie North. She said it sounded like the one. And she also said at one point it sounded a little like Donald. But through those two people, we pretty much had we had people convinced it was the one. And that's the only way Dwayne was brought into this. Uh, one of the ways he was brought into this case. That, uh, when when uh, Donald's name was mentioned, was he uh, brought in for questioning? Uh, when Ms. Norris mentioned his name? Yeah, Donald was brought in for questioning, and that's what we played the tape for him also. And uh, in, in, in mentioning the tape, I guess, as you know, that copies of that tape were available to us at that time. We made copies and we used it in the investigation, so why the defense attorney didn't know about it, I couldn't tell you that either. Uh, so then the, the search goes out for Dwayne, and Dwayne uh, is, is found and arrested, yes. and what, uh, how did the um, questioning of Dwayne Lee go at the outset? Well, Dwayne was real cooperative for some reason. He, uh, <laughs> he, uh, we didn't use any enhanced uh, Inter interrogation <laughs> techniques, but uh, uh, Dwayne changed the story a few times. He did at first in, in, uh, indicated that some of his relatives, his brother, cousins might have been involved in that. But, uh, <clears throat> When he finally got around to telling the truth, he told us that Ed Mondo helped him make that, or he watched it that they made the bomb in the basement of uh, Mondo's house. He always maintained that he set the suitcase in the house? Not all the time, but he did it enough time that we felt he'd be he'd do any court for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, at that point then, uh, in questioning uh, Dwayne, were Dwayne and Donald in the car or held at the same time? And, and did they have any interaction or did they have any conversations with any of the people or the Kevin's separate? I want to say they were separate most of the time because uh, we wanted to we wanted to sequester them, keep them apart so the story wouldn't get mumbled or lost. Okay. Uh, were, were there any times when you noticed Dwayne was more talkative? Did, was there an event or something that would make him more inclined to talk or uh, well as the as far as my role with Dwayne, I didn't uh, um, have that much contact with him. But from my understanding there was a couple other officers that talked to Dwayne on a regular basis and he was he was real talkative and and uh, he was bright. And remember, he was like 14, 15 years old at the time. So um, when he was talked to, um, he was like a child. He, he uh, told us what he wanted. Other members of the Peak family were brought in, is that correct? Yeah, we brought in quite a few because they were all indicated. And to be honest with you, I think more people should have been charged. I think uh, and this was a huge conspiracy, but that's out of our hands. That's where. As far as who gets charged is within the county attorney's office. But yes, we, we did have quite a few of the peaks. 
in our jailhouse and in, in, in interrogation rooms, getting stories from them. Was Dwayne aware of these family members who were brought in? Well, we let him know that his family was uh, all going to jail. So the investigation then shifts to um, then David Rice and, and Edward Poindexter. Can you take us through that um, process of investigating? Well, once we talked to the one and he gave us the information about where the, uh, where, who gave him the bomb and uh, how, where it was made and that, then those two at that point became the uh, prime suspects. But prior to that, no, until, uh, until he decided to tell us where the bomb was made. Uh, he had point extra and data right were not suspects. Were you familiar with these two individuals before uh, the name convention by doing no, I wasn't familiar with them directly, but I had heard their name. Uh, take us through the, the arrest then of, of both those men, um, and then where the investigation fled. Well, once the uh, arrest warrants were issued to them, uh, there was a Sergeant Marvin McClary, the officer at the time, him and Foxall worked out in the Community uh, Relations Department, which at that time was, I believe, located in the GOCA, uh, offices of Goka down on 24th Street. And uh, contact was made with them by Poindexter and Rice to uh, turn themselves in. So that's how we first got made contact with them. They were brought to the station along with other members of the community to turn themselves in. And then it, the, the focus shifted to David Rice's house? Yes. Could you uh, tell us about the search of that house? Well, what happened is we, we went to the house and I uh, was out walking around the house and my second response was we peeked in the windows and we saw evidence in plain sight. We saw wires, we saw suitcases, and we, we saw just everything that, uh, that made us believe that that was we're in the right place. So at that, then we uh, blocked off the neighborhood. We called in and to get a warrant, we, we uh, had the uh, area around the house shut down so we could go get the warrant. And then we uh, went in, and that's when I found the dining room. Is that common procedure to ward off that large of an area during a search? Well, we knew it was dangerous. There might be another explosion or something going on. So, yeah, we were trying to protect the public. Yeah. You entered the house. And once you received the warrant, you entered the house. Yeah, we waited till the warrant was in our hands, and then we went in the house. And take us through what you found in the house. Okay, I went down in the basement. And, uh, as one of the, back in the days, or before that, you know, a lot of the homes in North Carolina, and all around the city, had coal fed furnaces. So you had coal bins in your basement. And so we went down in the basement and hid behind the, the coal bin down there was uh, the box of dynamite. One box? There was, I believe, two boxes. Okay. I should have brought one and a half sticks. There was about 18 sticks or so. And how many were present in the basement? I was the only one there. Uh, no, uh, no one else went down until after I brought the dynamite out of the basement. So no photographs were taken of the dynamite in, in, in the place in the basement? No, it was too dangerous. Did you <laughs> carry that out? Yes, I carried it out and put it in the trunk of the car. <laughs> uh, considering the nature of what had happened on Ohio Street, when you entered the house and saw that there were allegedly various suitcases, um, why weren't, it, and we know what happened to Officer Menard with just either kicking or handling that suitcase, you know, why, upon seeing those suitcases, why weren't more steps taken to um, investigate whether or not they were loaded? Well, at that time, we didn't have a, uh, a bomb sniffing dog available. We could get one for an optic. I believe they have one available for us, but we did a matter of time. And as I walked through the house, and we saw these different things for making a bomb. So I let me back up when the first one in, that's when we started searching. And that's where I found those other suitcases in a closet. But then I went down through the house and found the, uh, uh, found the dynamite and uh, the tools for making explosives or making the bombs and wire cutters and other wires. That's when uh, uh, we conducted a general search and then went in the basement. So you saw the suitcases before, which may or may not contain loaded explosives. 
that didn't trouble you? Didn't, didn't think about it. Saw them in there, closed the door, they're in the closet. Closed the door? Yeah, they're in the closet. So we just closed the door and finished the search and then came and back. officers have been killed by suitcases following the previous. Okay. Right. So we, um, didn't, we didn't move them, so we figured everything was safe. Okay. Um, it, it, then after you brought the, the dynamite out of the house, <coughs> you then tied ropes to the suitcases. Is that what happened? Yes. Yeah. Tied the rope around the suitcase handles, led the rope out the front door, and dug down behind my cruiser, behind my uh, unmarked car at that time. Yeah. Were those suitcases then entered as evidence or kept by the, by the police? You know, I don't know what happened to them. Um, I just know they were in the house. I know we, uh, we found them there. And as far as it was somebody else's job to do the inventory, I didn't stay around for that. I was just, we had to get the dynamite out of there. So everything else, any other searches or inventories uh, as far as property that I, I had nothing to do with. See, I want to explain one more thing to you though. It's not unusual. It wasn't uncommon for us to, to put the soup, put the bomb, or correction, put the dynamite <laughs> in, the, in the trunk of a car. You mentioned something about some earlier guys found some. There's dynamite, there was three young men trying to sell some dynamite. And an informant called us and told us uh, where they were at. And so we went up there. I didn't go, but my lieutenant went. And that night when he found the dynamite, when he got that dynamite, it was placed in his car. He drove it home and didn't turn it in until the next day. So it was not uncommon for us to just, you know, we figured the dynamite was safe. But yeah, we uh, Lieutenant Perry took dynamite from that scene home too. Well, let's do a side step out of that. Uh, was were those three boxes of dynamite apprehended prior to Officer Bernard's death? Uh, no, I think it was afterwards. It was like no, well, I think it was like it was before, and it was like I think I want to say two months. July. Two months. Yeah. So. Are those three men then who had, were in possession of dynamite, uh, were they incarcerated at the time of Officer Bernard's death? I don't even think so. I'm not sure. I know they were released after Point Dexter and Rice were picked up. But, yeah, they, was it, were they released after their trial was acquitted or they were found in? They never went to trial. So they were, they were so right after we had the two that we wanted. So the three men with three boxes of dynamite are incarcerated, an officer's killed with dynamite, and they never go to trial. No. Which would have been an easy um, easy trial for a prosecuting lawyer in Omaha. They weren't black panthers. Um, all right, so the, the dynamite's taken, taken in and obviously done forensic testing. Uh, how, how are uh, Mr. Rice and Mr. Poindexter processed then after that? Well, we took their clothing. First, that dynamite went to a place in Council Bluffs where we used to store explosives. Um, I don't recall the name of it right now, but we, we took it over there and checked it in and stayed there. Um, once we had them, we took their clothing. I also uh, checked underneath their nails and, and did a check for explosive materials. Did Point Dexter and Rice's stories check out? I mean, at the, at the, the timeline that Wayne Peak sets up? As you interrogated Rice and Poindexter, did it? As far as uh, were they in town or stuff like that? Did it, did it, did it appear obvious that they were uh, conspirators? Well, yeah, because it didn't really matter much what they said, to be honest with you, because they, were, they had all the motives to lie. So what, uh, <coughs> we took the Wayne Peaks account story, what we went with. So essentially, you had three individuals with three stories, <coughs> no other corroborating witnesses other than those who allegedly drove Dwayne Peak over to the house. We had people who saw Dwayne with a suitcase. Right. And so, yeah, his story was uh, was checking out that he did have a suitcase prior to the explosion. As far as loading the suitcase in allegedly Mr. Rice's house, no one else was present at that time. Right, it just that uh, they told them how to make it, they showed them making the, uh, they showed me that, how uh, they showed Pete how the bomb, you know, that they're making a bomb, and then once it was made, gave it to him and told him where to take it to and to make the phone call. And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't uh, Mr. Peake allege that 
he didn't trigger the bomb, that he simply put the suitcase in the house and someone else was going to come around? Well, he put it in the house. That's, that's what I know he said. He, uh, he was responsible for placing it in the house. And the other two came back later to set it after he put it in there. I, I don't know. Okay. So as far as state's evidence goes, it's, it's Dwayne Peak. Dwayne Peak planted it, right? Yeah. Right. And, and since he gave us the guys who uh, who made it, you know, him being a kid and all, we had to figure we'd just get the adults who put them up to it. And simply because there was dynamite in the house doesn't necessarily implicate that they put it in the suitcase that killed Bernard. It's Dwayne Peak that... It's Dwayne Peak. Okay. He was eyewitness to that. Okay, so tell us, talk to us about the, the trial. Did you testify at the trial uh, in 1970? Yes, yes. I testified because I was, uh, I was one of the lead investigators on that. And did you follow the trial as it proceeded? Yes. And uh, when Dwayne Peake testified and reversed testimony while on the stand, can you take us through um, that process? Yeah, when he got on the stand, he seemed to have difficulty with his memory. Um, we went outside and talked to him about it and uh, tried to refresh his memory and showed him some reports, reminded him what he said earlier. And uh, he was kind of tearful and all. He didn't know. Uh, because he was, he was getting confused. You have to remember, again, he was a young boy and uh, he, was, he was just confused. So we had to help him out. It probably goes without saying that the, the 911 call was a key piece of evidence at the trial. And he admitted that he made the call. No, it wasn't. For some reason, they didn't. Uh, the, the defense, I guess, the defense. That was their strategy. They didn't want. They didn't want that tape to expose their guys, so they didn't play it. Did they have possession of it? As far as I know, they got it in discovery. They, uh, they, they should have. They knew about it. Okay. Um, did the jury's finding of Rice and Pete, uh, oh, excuse me, Rice and Poindexter, you know, when they declared them guilty, did that surprise you? Not at all, because we knew we had the right guys. We had, you know, those black radicals. We had them. So it didn't. There was no surprise. It was a solid case. I found the dynamite. He put it in there, and so it was a solid case. And Senator Chambers just mentioned earlier that uh, there's no point in looking back if you don't look forward. Uh, and obviously, this case has followed you since 1970. Do you have any thoughts or impressions with regards to the legacy and the fact that you've been called back to the stand um, after the original trial and, and how it's proceeded? You know, I expect those guys to keep saying they didn't do it. So I, you know, I know what I did during that time, and I know that we got the right guys, so they can call me back to my last day, and I'm going to say the same thing that I said at least the last time. So um, we, we, they did it. I said they did it. Questions, we'll all start. Yeah. Um, Sergeant, you said that uh, no court ever challenged what you said about the search. That's not true, because the uh, federal district court on the first appeal about an illegal search, in fact, Judge Warren Erbrom said that he could not believe the police testimony on this, and that was why, and they overturned the, the case on the basis saying it was an illegal search, and uh, he affirmed that and went to the Eighth Circuit Court. And likewise, first of all, three judges agreed with Warren Erbaum. And then they had an in-bank ruling where a full eight judges agreed with Warren Erbaum that they could not believe the testimony about the search. And the case was overturned right. on that basis. So it's not true that no court ever challenged what you're saying. True that to a certain degree. Now. The court, who ultimately, and remember, I'm, I'm, also, I'm wearing multiple hats. I'm a lot of officers today. When, when that court overruled or reversed and gave a new trial or said they should be sent back, it never happened, right? Did that trial ever take place? No. Okay, because another court above them said that we didn't have jurisdiction. There was no standing in that court. So whatever that court said, 
doesn't mean anything at this point. Or it didn't mean nothing then. Except that that court did have jurisdiction at that time. What the U.S. Supreme Court said when it went clear to the U.S. Supreme Court was not that they didn't have jurisdiction then, but that starting with this case and henceforth, they would not be allowed to have jurisdiction. So, in fact, when it was appealed, that court did have jurisdiction. Uh, it wasn't until the Supreme Court decision two years later that, they, that the Supreme Court decided retroactively that they would not have jurisdiction. And, uh, so, yeah, and, and so they, they it, might have questioned it was on. not. It was not a ruling on the invalidity of that court's statement. It was mm -hmm. only a procedural change in how courts would operate. That, that's true. I didn't, I didn't really know the cops really operate based on what the court says too much. You know, it's, I it's, that. <laughs> it's just pretty much what our own policies are. But the other part of that is, let's check the scoreboard. <laughs> so. Well, I agree with that. I mean, the, the white people change the rules. <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, I, I think we did, uh, we did, and what people need to appreciate is that we were trying to protect the public. You had a serious threat out there, so we were, um, and I'm not trying to say the ends justify the means, but that's kind of what was operating from, but it, it might have some rules being stretched, but we didn't intentionally go out and break any rules, and we didn't pick those two out. Uh, they just happened to be you know, the, 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 somebody from their community identifying them. We didn't identify them. We had no idea. At least for my standing now, if somebody else, else in the, in the uh, police department had a beef with them, I don't, I don't know. I never did. Where did uh, either Rice or Poindexter get the dynamite? It's believed that it might have came from a rock quarry out of Des Moines or even Washington County at the time. Not not sure. And it's a common type of dynamite, but it was commonly used in rock quarries, and so it's easily accessible. So as far as who directly gave it to them, it didn't matter to us. Um, where we got it from, it wouldn't matter. So you said that when you and your partner were walking around the house looking in the windows, you saw that evidence all over the place. Yes. Is that when you saw the dynamite for the first time? No. We saw the dynamite after going in the house. Okay. But there was, there was stuff laid out that made it look like um, it's possible what Dwayne Peake had told us was, was accurate. Right. So if you were making a bomb, you'd leave the stuff all out. <laughs> scattered all over the place. <laughs> I wouldn't, but they oh. did. <laughs> so, yeah, they, uh, I was uh, surprised at that. And the house was, was, I have to admit, uh, the house was open, so we really didn't have to walk around it if we wanted to. If we were trying to violate the rules, we would have just went out and went inside. Um, but we, uh, we respect the, the letter of the law, and we uh, backed off until we could get the search warrant. Have you ever been asked to go back to the house to point out where, where it was found? No, for some reason that house burned down shortly after the time of the dynamite. The house was burned to the ground. On the same day that Dwayne Peake disappeared. And that's coincidence. Oh dear. Who burned the house down? Don't know. Uh, they have to ask the arson investigators, and we never got to know each other. That wasn't our concern. What evidence did you have that uh, these two had the ability to make bombs? Well, Poindexter has a military background. You have to remember he served in Vietnam. So that, that's probably where he, where he got it from. But he didn't make any, he didn't have anything to do with uh, weapons during the Vietnam War. He was operating, he was taking care of cars and trucks. Because, so, uh, so that wasn't his. But we know those guys talk to each other. So, I might talk. But also, you have to remember during that time, Des Moines uh, had a guy affiliated with their chapter who traveled around to other Panther organizations to teach bomb making. They had bomb making classes that they taught each other, and uh, that's quite a possibility that they learned from the Panther member out of Des Moines. Because there's a similar type bomb found 
in the area in, in another police station, I'm going 48 remains at the time, it's not there anymore, but there was a bomb found there in the same basically type of dynamite and stuff. So in Des Moines. One in Omaha too. In Omaha there was a they had a bombing at the police station at 48 remains. And then there was another one that underneath a, a bridge overpass where dynamite was found. Did, did the NCCF ever publish um, literature about making bombs? They're always saying stuff about getting the pigs. So <laughs> we, uh, I don't know if they told people how to make bombs or not, but they did have a lot of anti-police rhetoric in their, uh, in their publications and in the speeches that they used to go around making. Did they like tell people to go kill cops? Not directly, but I can recall when when uh, and I don't know what they said in private meetings, but I can recall uh, David Rice telling people don't throw bricks and bottles at cruisers. All you do is dent up cars. You got to do it differently. So I think that was indication he was meaning to hit the cops with those bricks and bottles, not the cars. What, what form did the uh, this so-called bomb was found in? Was it pro form, as if they was, or was it already compounded in the, the The bomb in the house was already it blown up. So I don't know how it was. Uh, we figured it was, it was maybe a typical three-stick configuration. You have a triggering device, so and once the suitcase was moved, it was, it was supposed to be far as exactly how it was uh, I mean, it was it was destroyed in the explosion. Oh so um any fingerprints was found the like no device? about two doors down from the house on Ohio Street where it was blowing up we did find some wire cutters that we believe came from the one uh, came from Mondo's house. So the, that that uh some wire clippings and uh, other evidence was found. No prints or nothing? No, no. So just believing that he's... Yeah, they covered the tracks. <laughs> when you guys cordoned off the block, did was there people inside the, the area that you sectioned off? Now there was people who claimed that we chased them out of the house when we got there. I believe his brother and a couple others were, uh, said they saw us coming. But uh, no, there was no one in the house at the time we searched it. Because when we got there, a few people did run and were, were caught and arrested. And uh, but as far as when the house was searched, there was nobody there with us. So you know, nobody, nobody saw you guys investigating? No, not really, not to our knowledge. Nobody saw, uh, I don't think any, no one saw us bringing the dynamite out or none of that. Gotta take our word for it. I'm going to ask a sort of editorial question, so just your general opinion uh, from the perspective of the Omaha police, but in 1958 or 59, um, Carolina Pugate was sentenced to life for alleged accessory to the Starkweather homicides, becoming the youngest uh, American to be sentenced to a life sentence. When we consider uh, Mr. Peake and his involvement, and the fact that for his uh, testimony he receives uh, immunity from serving time. How did that play with regard to the Omaha police, knowing that probably his uh, uh, sentence was probably looming as well? Well, I'll tell you, we felt everybody should have been charged. More people should have been uh, charged in this case. A uh, few uh, more of the Peak family. Um, there was a, 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 another radical troublemaker, Ernie Chambers. We believe he was a uh, uh, he was a Panther. He's either a Panther or he was a, a Panther sympathizer. He was always around. There was times when we questioned the Panther, and he would show up. <laughs> uh, you go to the headquarters, he would tell them not to talk to us. So it's in my belief, as Lieutenant Perry, that. Ernie Chambers should have been charged, and I believe to this day that that's who you need to question about this case. He's withholding evidence, and, and David Rice is withholding evidence. I believe that they, uh, if you can get them aside and get them to tell the truth, they, they will tell you that they did have something to do with it, and that, uh, that I really believe, I, I was angry with the prosecutors for not charging more people and charging them, but I believe <coughs> 
that uh, those two know more than what they're telling you. Was Duane ever put on trial? No. Is there a statute of limitations for homicide? No. So he could conceivably be retried again, or tried? No, because he uh, he was given he was given immunity for his uh, testimony, and so there's uh, uh, nothing to be done to Duane right now, unless we prove that he killed somebody. I mean, but as far as he never was, uh, I don't think he was charged. There's some people who were charged, and their charges haven't even been dropped to this day. Go ahead, Beth. May I ask a question of Sergeant Pfeffer? Yep. Or Lieutenant Perry, too, because he's saying that Ernie Chandler did it. And, uh, Sergeant Pfeffer, do you know that Dwayne received immunity? No, but I know about he was he was shipped out of state. That's about all I really. I know he, Sam Cooper and... Knowles, I believe, made that decision not to prosecute him, and there might be one other in on that. But there was a decision that was made that he wouldn't be he wouldn't be uh, prosecuted if he cooperated, and that's what he did. And, uh, and he works for the police now, right? He works as a policeman. No. Who's that, Dwayne? Dwayne. No, not that, not that I know of. Oh, I he's, he no, he's had uh, quite a storied life since he left the mom. But never in law enforcement. He was involved with law enforcement. <laughs> and, and, and there's a couple other, you know, something that, that, that came out too is that not only, you know, some people think, uh, you know, Raleigh House is now living in the same state, a few miles apart away from Duane. There's also a member of the student, I want to call it Student Democratic Society, SDS, who some people think he has something to do with this. He also lives in Washington State. Now, uh, maybe y'all should dig around. Maybe <laughs> Mike can help us. Uh, when you took Mr. Pete out because he was having trouble remembering, uh, you said you didn't use any extraordinary investigator interrogation techniques. What did you do or say to him to help him remember? I just reminded him that he had a weird. Um, Stick to the same story and remember what we said. And so we just talked about what we talked about prior to him going in the courtroom. We just need to have a memory refresh a little bit. So we didn't really, I'll put it this way, I didn't see anybody do anything to him. But on that same token, uh, Mr. Peak was transferred to Fremont, is that correct? Yes. And is it commonplace with a trial of this magnitude to take a suspect, the prime suspect, um, out to dinner, uh, to a restaurant, and I believe to a local motel for questioning. We want to keep him relaxed <laughs> and, uh, and make him feel comfortable. You guys got to keep in mind he was a young kid, and we're trying to keep some of the fears out of him. When you when you met at the Silver Lighting restaurant in Fremont, <laughs> was it Omaha police and lawyers from the state meeting together? I, I don't recall that one. I think um, that, I a lot of times he was questioned by uh, Pittman Foxhall, I believe, or Aaron Daly, and uh, there was a couple, a couple of the cops that handled him once he was, uh, as far as his interrogation. I, I didn't interrogate him, but uh, the others who uh, um, might have taken him to dinner or whatever, but that was, the, again, that would be the prosecutor's call. That would be Pinky, I don't know, Pinky Knowles or, uh, well, I know Sam Cooper was having involved. Uh, uh, Sergeant Pfeffer, uh, do, do you know, can you talk a little bit about your, whether or not you or other officers worked with the FBI? Um, we had very little contact with the FBI. They, uh, we handled our cases and they handled theirs. Uh, I personally didn't work with any FBI agents. There were uh, um, some that might have been involved because they also had investigations going against the Panthers. But this case here was strictly a state case. So, but the FBI, uh, we didn't have the best relationship with them. Sergeant Pepper, I believe that uh, World Herald, in fact, printed early on that the FBI was involved. They, they might have been. They, they, like I said, they were involved in, because uh, they were investigating the Panthers also. But, and then we also sent stuff to their lab, to, um, like the, uh, 
dynamite, the uh, tape was sent to the lab. Um, a couple of things sent to the FBI, which came back saying, what we well, not what we told them to say, but I excuse me on that. I came <laughs> back with the same conclusions we had. Uh, I, let me interject and then we'll get to your question too, because that, that triggered a thought that I had in reading one of the police reports. I believe it was taken on August 22nd, which is three or four days after uh, Dwayne was uh, incarcerated. Excuse me, uh, no. Donald um, was brought in and the police department asked if he would take a polygraph. And he agreed to it, but then asked what a polygraph was, not knowing exactly. And then after that, asked about voice analysis. And <laughs> in the police report, it states that voice analysis is sent to Washington, uh, which I would assume then is a federal level. Um, obviously, the, the Omaha police had an idea of how this evidence would be handled. And obviously, Donald Peake was very concerned about how this piece of evidence would be handled. Can you speak to that at all? Well, just that, uh, yeah, we did send it off, and a lot of that I didn't get involved with after the, uh, you know, as far as the evidence, that goes to the crime lab and to uh, other divisions, but um, yeah, it was it was sent off to uh, the analyzer. I learned later that uh, they did not send back, no, there's no written record of, uh, of the, what the results of that test were. Is it, is it common for people who are accused of crimes to ask about processing of evidence? And just some do, some do. Question. Um, in regard to the last question, was asked about if you had any connection with the FBI, uh, would your supervisor have had connection that you would simply do what your supervisor would tell you? You go out and investigate, go do this. Right. Would you know about your supervisor? Because you'd be sent out by somebody to do some of the things you've just described. Right, there was some overlapping. And, and there was, like, say, um, I didn't deal with the FBI, but some of the officers on the street might have dealt with it because the FBI also, remember, they had informants that were within the Panther organization, and they were conducting their own investigations of the Panthers at the time. And it was of interest to the Washington, D.C. office of what was going on in the town because there was, the, you're dealing with nationwide subversives. So you had to have somebody um, coordinating this because what was going on in Omaha was also going on in Cleveland, Des Moines, Oakland, and around the country. So uh, yes, that's where our FBI involvement might have been. But um, as far as us sitting down with them, I've heard rumors that that happened, but really my team didn't sit down with the, uh, with the FBI. I did have, I talked to field officers who said they ran into agents because there was some overlapping. They were both investigating the same. We were investigating the same people. We both of us had wiretaps, so we had informants working inside. So, but basically, there was no formal relationship with the FBI. But well, I still didn't hear whether or not the people directing you. That's possible. I, I wouldn't know that. I didn't. I don't know if they did or didn't. Did uh, Sergeant Pepper? Did the Omaha Police Department have informants as members of the Panthers in Omaha? Yes. The Omaha Police Department did? Yes. And, and, and did you know uh, who the FBI informants were? No, I don't. I don't know who all of the, I don't know the police informants because that was someone else's job to cultivate. I investigated and tried to get some with the intelligence guys. There were some officers that, uh, who did have people that have been in the Panther organization that have worked with them. I have another question going back to the suitcases that you talked about attaching to a, to a rope and pulling out of the house. Why wasn't there a police report that recounted that story? Yeah, I, I don't know what happened to that. I, uh, I, I was there, and what I'm telling you is what happened. And after I got the dynamite, I left to take it down to the headquarters. Did you remember? That's where we took the pictures, sat down at the, uh, we got away from the scene. And so whatever happened at the scene, I wasn't responsible for because I already did my part and left. But somebody could have misplaced the reports, but I did write a report on what I found there. And there are other people, such as Lieutenant Perry and others, who would tell you the same thing that I had to rope and, you know, I was there with the, uh, with the suitcases.
But I don't know what happened to those reports. Given the importance of the nature of that specific evidence, the dynamite, how, how much documentation in terms of photograph do we have of that whole process? Well, there should be, there's a couple photographs of the dynamite in the suitcase. There's, uh, are in, in the uh, trunk of the, of the car. <laughs> now, as far as uh, in the report was made and showing the chain of evidence, uh, who, who put the dynamite, checked it into the property room. And like I said, at that time, the property room, you, you didn't check dynamite into the property room. You, you would fill out the reports and then you would take it over to, uh, to Council Bluffs, to a storage facility over there, and that's where it was maintained. But given the nature of this discovery, which is you have suspects, you have dynamite in a suspect's home, and given the fact that this would be the key piece of evidence, why weren't photographs taken inside the house of the suitcases of the basement? Um, well, see, knowing yeah. that the, this case hinged on um, your finding and also the fact that this was the homicide of a fellow police officer. Well, see, that's what I'm trying to tell you, son. You have a little bit of understanding of dynamite and how we collect evidence. When you're in an enclosed facility like that, down in that house, you're taking photographs. It's not like today where you have this digital equipment. Back then you used flash bulbs. So there was a chance that when you took a picture in that house, you could blow it all the place up because the flash could have ignited the uh, dynamite particles that were down there or the explosives. Uh, so yeah, that was... But after the dynamite was carried to the car and the suitcases were dragged into the street. Couldn't there have been some more investigative documentation of what you dragged out of the house, what were the holes from, et cetera? Once the dynamite was outside, it had a different environment. It exposure to the air. And so you didn't have the same problem you would have contained in a small environment such as the basement. Right, but why weren't more photos of other elements taken. We had what we needed. <laughs> we, we went down, we found dynamite. Uh, there was a photo, there should have been a photo taken of the, of the uh, coal bin. And then uh, once the dynamite was removed, a photo was taken. And, and, you know, we had to get rid of the danger there. So you kept dynamite near a coal furnace? No, not in the furnace, it's where the coal bin, where the coal would be stored at. Okay. Are there any other questions people have with regard to questions that still linger? And I, I'll close by saying that, um, again, we, uh, I don't have any fears of, uh, of other documents are released and that I'm sticking by the story. And, uh, I, I don't know why you wouldn't believe me. I worked all my life, committed to, to serving the public, and, and we did everything according to the book. Might be a book we wrote, but we did it according to the book. <laughs> <laughs>